I stepped out of my comfort zone into a country that is probably one of the most restrictive in the world. And the reality of it is that it was intimidating, it was new, it was exciting, but I was shitting myself because I didn't know how to fit into that culture. But hundreds and hundreds of people on site with maybe a few percent of them that actually spoke English or English at all very well. The reality of it was that majority of my engineers or whatever that I was working with were also my interpreters to speak Arabic and to do all these things. And I went there and my roster was 10 weeks on, two weeks off. Nine months into that contract, I found myself crying in the corner of my cabin, just wondering, what the fuck have I got myself into? Where am I? What am I doing? And why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? I didn't know what was going on. Welcome to the Beers with a Miner podcast. My name is Mad Mumsy and I've been driving the huge dump trucks in Australian open cup mines for over 10 years now. I wish I had a dollar for everyone who said to me, how does a little thing like you drive those big trucks? Oh, you must be rich. How do I get a job doing that? My mining friends are asked these questions all the time too. This is what started the Mad Mumsy journey to share stories and tips from living a mining lifestyle and to let others know what it's really like. Tune in each episode as I sit down for a relaxed chat, usually over a few beers, with a fellow miner. Women and blokes with various experience, roles and opinions share their lessons and stories with you. Not everyone is cut out to be a miner, but why not? What does it take to thrive and survive in this industry? Now, let's dig in. Get it? Dig. Mining. Oh, crack me up. Hello and welcome to episode 74 of the Beers with a Miner podcast. My name is Mad Mumsy. And before we dive into this episode, this happy hour episode with Paul Smith, I just want to start with a bit of an update by saying Happy New Year. It's 2021 and it's actually nearly the middle of February. Like, wait, what? <laughs> Happy New Year, Mad Mumsy. Where you been? You're missing out. Um, I have I just felt the need to reach out and say something. And if you're listening to this in the future, well, you haven't missed a beat. But I have had a few people messaging me and asking if I'm still doing the podcast and also if I'm okay. 2020 was a pretty crazy year for all of us and we thought that for some reason, well I did, and they kept saying 2021, it'll all be different. Well, nothing much has changed really. We're still living in a COVID world and we're very lucky to be here in Australia a lot better off than many places, but we're still having our own challenges. Just last week, WA had a scare and all their FIFO workers were, many of them, stuck out on site. Um, you know, the challenges of that, as well as what is going to happen now with this outbreak for them. But luckily, it seems like it had been nipped in the bud. And by locking the state down, they were able to see what was going on and it looks like they've got through. However, you know, you can never tell in this new crazy COVID world, but it was really good to see everyone sticking together and trying to support each other and encouragement to keep those boots on that are going to help you and your family get through these times. I know it sucks if you had to stay on site when it was your fly out day, which I know happened to a few people very close to me. And then it changed and they were allowed to come home. We just don't know. And it's a very changing times and we've just got to put our ease and flow boots on, I guess, and get through it the best we can. I wanted to share with you a few things that have been going on. I, <laughs> I don't like the word these are my excuses for not coming up with a podcast for you. But I will say I have two wonderful interviews that I've already done that I've just got to do all the rest of the bits with. The actual interviews, that's the easy part. It's the editing 
and all the post-production stuff and then getting it out there, which is something I love doing. And in fact, it's a service I offer through my College of Riverhouse Productions business. But it feels like that has been taking over a little bit lately because if you know me and if you follow me on Facebook, you would know that I now have a brand new studio in a special place that my friend has set up here in central Queensland and it's called Wellness Corner. It's in Marion in the old chook shop and a lot of you local miners in like heading out to the northern Bowen Basin area would drive past here a lot. I know I have over the years many, many times. And I am also helping the practitioners that come in join their digital dots, which is what I do. It's my passion and I love it. So now poor old Mad Mumsy lately has been put to the side whilst the techno nana in me comes out. But I'm here to let you know I haven't gone away. We've just been on a bit of a delay. So we're back into it. I have this episode with Paul and then I have another one coming up with a person who reached out to me on Instagram, FIFO Inspo, a cool dude who does videos from his donger and we had a great chat as well. So that'll be episode 75. And then on Australia Day, I went down to my local pub and had a fantastic time there. They unveiled the big thongs. So if you ever go to Caelan in central Queensland, head in there, get your photo with the newly unveiled big thongs and the Walkabout Oz brand, which is also going to be someone I'm going to be working with very closely to help get the word out about that my latest five-star client, Naughty. Hi, Naughty. Um, so, and... On that day, I had three people who were keen to come on the podcast. So we've got Whopper, Naughty and Cole, who are all going to chat to us about their mining journey and lots of stories as well. So there's still plenty to come and I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. The other thing that has happened is my kid's dad sadly passed away and he's over in the UK in London And so there's all the logistics of getting him home and dealing with your kids' broken hearts. And we were together for 22 years, so my heart has been broken as well. And it comes in waves, you know, and um, I know many of us are dealing people who die and um, our family has had a lot of those and I certainly know that... We're not special in that way. It happens to all of us. But we need to all stick together and be there for our family. And for me, family first, then everything else, which is why the main reason I've been missing in action. Anyway, (laughs) let's get stuck into this episode with Paul. I hope you enjoyed. It is a long one. But, you know, hey, podcast, we got time. Just hit pause and come back to it later. So he shares with us many wonderful stories and his passions about everything that he loves to share now about his uh, FIFO journey and, you know, (laughs) why did he delay his first offer that he got to get a FIFO job? And he said, oh, hang on a minute, hang on a minute can't do it yet. I just got to sort something out. What was that? And then he had planned to be doing this basically, you know, for a long time, but he was forced out. What happened after that? Keep listening. Great chat. Paul Smith, a wonderful friend and a great supporter of myself and hard hat mentor, my sister and especially for our new podcast, What Boots. What? You didn't know about that? Just search for What Boots in your favourite podcast app and you can listen to me and my sister raving on about all sorts of things, not just mining. Anyway, that's enough from me. Let's dig in. Get it? Dig. Mining. Ha, ha, ha. I cracked me up even in 2021. <laughs> Cheers. In this happy hour episode, we're hanging out with Paul Smith, also known as the FIFO coach. 
we've connected on LinkedIn, I think, for the first time yep. uh, through Drewy, my sister, I, I believe, and we've lined up a few times where we were going to do a podcast or we were just going to have a chat and then usually me has to cancel for whatever reason and then you said yesterday or a couple of days ago, oh, well, let's do it. Well, I think I thought of it ages ago and then cancelled, <laughs> but let's do a Facebook Live and just have a chat about what it is that you're doing now because I wanted to help share the message and share the great things that you're doing um, with my peeps. And then I thought, well, why don't we just make it a podcast episode as well, which we've been trying to do as well. So here we are. Finally, welcome to the podcast, Paul Smith. Uh, pleasure to be here and finally to catch up and uh, have a beer <clears throat> somewhat in person anyway. It's the new thing anyway, Zoom and StreamYard and Facebook Lives and catching up. So, no, it's really, it's really cool to actually sit down and have a yak as well. So thanks for having me. Well, that's fine. And what, what about like what a year we've had, hey, 2020, Zoom. It's so funny that everyone's like, oh, Zoom. Like, you're probably like me. You've been on it for a couple of years now. You know all about Zoom. I was doing my interviews on Skype, but it used to drop out all the time. So yeah. then I've discovered Zoom and and you, you get the separate recording, the uh, separate tracks of each person in the audio, which I'm not sure if I'm going to get from StreamYard, hence our double enders. Um, so it, it just doesn't drop out as much, I found. And you had to have another app to make it work, and oh, so Zoom it up. I just oh, wish I'd bought great, shares yeah. in Zoom. Oh, yeah, for Would have sure. been. <laughs> well, already had them. You know, you don't buy them when they're high, do you? No. All right. That's yeah. Um, the only one that worked for me as well, personally. So overseas, especially Zoom. So, yeah, Skype, yeah. and that was all all banned and yeah, regulated, and yeah, it was nothing worked to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it, and then Zoom did up their security and everything, so that was that was good too, um, because of so many people being on it. Like this is crazy, wasn't it? This is like nuts. Everyone on Zoom. All right, I went to buy a a new TV. I just needed a little one, and they were sold out. You couldn't get them because people were working from home, and everyone was setting up their little home office. So because they were on Zoom. Hence, 2020, baby. That's <laughs> what we now do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. All right, let's get this show on the road. As this podcast is called The Biz with a Minor Podcast, I like to start these happy hour episodes with my guests sharing their favourite beverage and also their favourite time to enjoy it. It could be a beer, wine, spirit, or perhaps even a cup of tea. What is yours, Paul? Well, I've always been a beer lover. I'm not going to lie there. Uh, my favourite beer in general is a 150 Lashes Pale Ale. I'm uh, actually on the Smithies cans at the moment because they're pretty good value, I must admit, and they're not a bad drop. Bit of a namesake as well, so why not? But uh, yeah. also a sneaky gin and tonic I'm not shy of either. So there we are. A gin and tonic, did you say? Mm. A gin and tonic yes. always goes oh. down very well. Story behind why as well. Oh, <laughs> I need a story. That's good. Yes. So the story behind the gin and tonic was uh, never a gin and tonic fan, but when I was working overseas where alcohol wasn't allowed but was accessible if you knew the right people, should we say, um, <laughs> well, this particular uh distiller shall we call him was able to make his own uh, gin and tonic or gin a pink gin with a local flower from overseas and i came quite accustomed to being able to have that because the homebrew beer was disgusting and it left you mm -hmm. with a shocking headache but as he was studying distillery and creating what he created and all different varieties the gin and tonic or the pink gin and tonic was uh the weapon of choice over there. So that's how that began about three and a half years mm -hmm. ago. And ever since it's got better and better, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have it yeah. with ice? Do you put Definitely. ice in it as well? Yeah. Definitely with ice. Yeah. Yeah. That's the go. 
Beautiful. Thanks for sharing that with us. All right. So you you talk a lot about FIFO and a lot of your branding is all around FIFO and how to make it work and not be so challenging is how, you know, what can you do to succeed? When you say FIFO, does that mean you have to get on a plane? Or do you also mean people who do Dido, Bibo, Siso, Hi-Ho, like people who are working away from home generally in mining construction? Is that where you're coming from or definitely yeah, just it, on a plane? It is. It's living away from home and, and working away from home for those extended period of times. And, look, there's lots of CEOs and things around the world that actually – relate to the message as well because they're away from home for us mm-hmm. you know from a period of time so whilst because it's relatable to myself and what I've done that FIFO and whatever we call it, I've done the diet up as well so but it's I mean the long rosters when you live at home and you still drive to work and you're still doing the 14 hours 15 hours a day whilst the time you travel it's still relatable to so many people the message is the same it's purely the fact that that FIFO is really what it's known as, I guess, to the majority of people. Even though overseas people don't see it as FIFO necessarily, you have to explain it what that is. And when you explain it as that fly in, fly out, jump on a plane, go to work for a couple of weeks and come home sort of scenario, then they start to relate to what that message is about and being away from family and friends and isolated and all those sorts of things. So, yes, it's a it's mm-hmm. a big bubble of what it actually is. Yeah, it it. It seems to be that it's become an umbrella term for yep. people that are doing that. You're packing up your shit, you're going away from your family or your pets or your garden or, like, not everyone's got family, your friends, mm-hmm. whatever it is, you're away and then you're going into, what, a donger for how long, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, some people, you know, or yep. it might be a flash motel if you're one of those big CEOs overseas. <laughs> Can't say that <laughs> I've had one of those on my podcast. Um, but, yeah, okay, I'm just checking right from the start that we're on the same page about that. I was pretty sure that we were. Yeah, no, it's definitely that overarching thing, but it's just, as we all know, people seem to know FIFO as mining. Yeah. Yeah, and then as my blister, hard hat mentor, fellow steel cap sister, says there's a lot of people in construction within mining as well. Mm. So there's a lot of people who are building railway camps or new mills or like all sorts, it, like it's endless really, or new mines, new camps. So there's a lot well, of construction people within the mining industry. And it's funny you say that because all of my experience in mining has been from project mining infrastructure and those projects types, so building new mines, expansions of mines, all of those things. So I'm not technically a miner per se. I've always been in the project side of things. And when I was overseas, it was in construction. It wasn't even in mining, but it was, you know, live away from home for three months at a time and come back for two weeks sort of thing. So that's... You know, my story is different whilst working in a mining environment, not necessarily driving a dump truck or using a face shovel or whatever it might be. You're in around it, you're working in with it, but you're not part of it. So it is an interesting thought. It is, yeah, that's right. And I've done a whole episode on what makes a real miner. (laughs) um, (laughs) I'll link to that in the show notes (laughs) the show notes can be found for this episode at madmumsy.com forward forward slash beers 74 the number 74 and I'll share all the links to all the wonderful things that Paul's doing and also that episode about what makes a real minor and any other wonderful things that we need to share as we go on so um just before we move on, do you know what SISO and HIHO are? Have you heard of those before? I don't really understand that guess? terminology. No. <laughs> no, you let me yeah, tell me. I, I, it's well, interesting on that. Are you ready? <laughs> it's yeah. only because of someone that came on my podcast and her husband worked on the oil rigs off uh-huh. WA, I think it was, and was away for like months at a time. and. Yep. 
she actually wrote a book called uh, Separated by Work. And um, oh, that, yeah, that. Kirsty O'Callaghan. So I shall share that also in the show notes. Um, but SISO is ship in, ship out. And hi ho, which is my favorite one. <laughs> Helicopter in, helicopter out. Oh, hi ho, yes, hi ho! It's <laughs> off to work we go. <laughs> so I'd I've never heard of it either. Doing that, and I've spoken to people do that, but I've never actually heard that acronym for it, to be honest. And yeah, yeah, there's lots of people in that oil and gas and do those sorts of things, and that's yeah, that's a whole new level, I think. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I don't know that I'd like to do that. I know my daughter would; she loves helicopters, but. Whether it was to go to work on an oil rig, I don't think so. Maybe fly over and have a look and come back. Yeah. So, I so. Um, I'm just going to, before we start about how you got into your FIFO journey, I just need to open another beer. How's yours going? Yeah, we'll get through this You're one right? for the next, the next question. <laughs> All right. Well, I just need to make my most favorite sound in the world. I noticed you're on a cans as well. It's. K-tsh. Oh, Casey there it is. Reg. There it is. That's my Reggie. Eh? <laughs> it's a beer per question, right. is it? It is. <laughs> no, absolutely not. No way. <laughs> Probably that would be my last one unless I need to hit. See, that's it. You can't just, well, I could. I probably will duck off and get another one if we go long. All right, Paul, how did you get starting, started, sorry, in FIFO? There's a fairly in-depth bit of a twist to all of that. So let me give you a little bit of background and how that that journey began. And I'm a carpenter by trade. So I left school and did that, you know, 16 years old. So I was a tradesman by the time I was 20. And that was great, building houses and, you know, million-dollar waterfront properties and all that amazing stuff. And as a kid, it was just sort of that mind-blown, wow, look look at these places we get to build. And it was in that time, it was that thought process of, building these places that people are investing so much into to create something for their family. And that's that's when I look mm. back, that's where that sort of began. And it's like, wow. As I went through my own journey and then I was married very early, kids early, uh, my daughter just turned 18 last week and my son's 22 and now a new relationship with um, 11-year-old twins. So it's – but – through that journey through those 20s and being a subcontractor and then the GST came in and I got myself into trouble with tax and all those things, I was still in the the party drugs and rock and roll sort of lifestyle and trying to work. And, you know, I look back and, and, and see myself as a, a, a high-functioning addict, to be honest, through that through that 20s. Mm. And wow. it, got, it got to a point where... Um, through separation, you know, I was married to my first wife for 10 years, but we were, ma- we were married for three years and it was quite rocky. We were separated for three years and we got back together for a bit over three years. So altogether sort of a 10-year sort of 20s to 30s sort of mark, that was all a bit of a blur and a lot of messy times, good times and messy times, if that makes sense. But through that period, it was like because all, you know, child support and all these things came in, that subcontractor wage and that, you know, that hit and miss of what was going on, I had to have something that was a bit more permanent. Now, a mate reached out at that time, you know, my, probably my best mate, and said, look, I could probably offer you a job into the civil industry. I said, well, that's all well and good, but I, I won't pass the drug test, so I need to get back to you. <laughs> I need to get back to you on that one. So sure enough, Give me a couple I made of months, that- mate. Yeah, and, and it was, and that was the reality of it for me back then. And, you know, it was just smoking a lot of pot. So that we know that takes a lot longer to get out of the system. So I made that choice there and then that I needed to do something different and make that change. And for the next eight to ten weeks, I self-tested every Friday, would go to the chemist and buy the little pee in the jar thing that we all love so much. Um, that was oh, my man. first taste. That was my first taste, self-testing. So yeah. it was it was that to the point where I was said I'm ready I can do this now um, if that's still available. So I 
got rid of the whole subcontracting, building these beautiful homes and public works and hospitals and doing all this great stuff as a carpenter and went back to filling sandbags as a labourer to get a start into the civil industry. And it was like, all right, if this is what I need to do, I can find a way to, to make it work. And it was it was that. And I went back to doing those things and, you know, those shitty jobs that no one likes to do, the apprentice jobs that we, we you know, but I did it. <laughs> and, you know, and it was great. And it got me a start with a company that I ended up staying with for eight years. And through that, I was able to progress into that leading hand foreman type type roles and then you know running small crews which then stepped me into what just so happened was a great chance we were doing a huge upgrade of the coal handling facilities in Newcastle so one of the biggest ports in the in Australia so as mm. we know and we did a huge expansion that I ended up getting about eight years worth of work out of there and that sort of stepped me right through and running big crews and being able to, you know, I guess prove my worth, I guess, in in that role and be able to, you know, get into that supervision type scenario. Um, that all came to an end and um, or like you could see the writing on the wall. The project was coming to the end and I was able to get a – I went and applied for a job. It was my time to leave that company um, on great terms. They were a great company. and. Um, yeah, got into the the drive in, drive out. So the Hunter Valley area of Newcastle is a huge mining area. Mm. So some really big, really big open cut mines up there, and some underground mines as well, which I never experienced and I never want to. But <laughs> getting into that, and again into the project works and the expansion works of all those things. Um, so yeah, that was my first experience into that, and then that slowly progressed into one of the supervisors or the guys I used to work with asking for an opportunity to come up to um, build one of the mines in Murrumbah. So I won't name drop the mine. It's a one of the one of the newer ones, one of the bigger ones down there on the Peak Downs Highway, I guess it is, whatever it is. Um, Peak Downs Highway, the highway of death, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> yeah. shouldn't so, laugh. No, it, need, it needs help. Mm, yeah. Carry on. So, yep. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, that was my first taste into the the FIFO lifestyle, you know, and working on a ten and four roster in the projects and and doing that thing, then getting to supervise subcontractors essentially. So working for that, you know, that EPCM type contractor and and managing subcontractors. So that that was my first taste of it. I have a question. Um, EPCM. What does that mean? So it's the engineering procurement contract management type side of things. So oh. again, again, without name dropping, it's you know it's the company that comes and oversees and manages the whole construction side of it, whilst all the subcontractors do the work. If that makes sense. Okay. Yes. So it they, does. Thank you. Yes. So in the construction project side of thing, there's a lot of that that goes on, of course. So one big company looks after the people that actually do the work. So yeah, so yeah, got to work for that, and that um, that was really good. I really enjoyed that, but again, it was challenging. I was single at that stage, and oh, you know, relationships here and there, and the the that side of it, I thought, well, this is this is great. It wasn't easy. It was different. It was new. It was exciting. It was you know still that little bit of up and comer trying to prove his worth again that he could still do something different and and progress and. Um, yeah, where would it take me? What could I? What could I get out of that? You know, obviously the money was better, and it was those opportunities that came with that, uh, and it was my kickstart into it. Yeah. So, how long once you started? Thank you for sharing that. By the way, that was that. That's a journey. That's a that's a big change from being a carpenter on big flash houses and hospitals to hanging out at Newcastle and the Hunter and Moranbar. Yeah, it is a big change and you were still young then, weren't you? So that's, I guess, a time when we um, when we do try things out. Some people don't. They just go and work somewhere and stay there forever or get sick of it when they're 40 and now what? What am I going to do? But, um, yeah, you've, you've had a few different tastes of different things so did you decide then what I'm trying to get at 
is that that's what you love and that's what you want to keep doing? Or did you just think, I've got those experiences now, what else could I do? Or ha- what happened after that? My honest thought process was when I was working with that company in Newcastle doing the expansions of that big coal handling facility, I was working, there was this company that had a lot of older guys. Now, when I say older guys, they were nearing that retirement age. So anywhere from that late 55, mm. 55 to 65 mark and some really, really great guys that knew and mm. they taught me so much and it was and it was never managing those people. It was asking them, this is what we need to achieve. How do we achieve it? Because you're the guys that are driving these things and these machines. I knew nothing about machines, you know, but how do you do that? What do we need to do to ensure we can get this done? I need it done, you know, 10 minutes ago always as the as the bosses do, yeah, whatever. But um, how, how do we actually achieve that? And through that through that thought process and, and, and that rapport with people, they were able to, you know, provide the outcomes. They were the guys, they were the skilled people, which taught me so much. Oh, wow, this is, I don't need to tell them how to do it. I just need to, I just need to know that this is what we need to achieve. How do you go about achieving it? But what, what made me realize was that these people have worked their whole life. And it, it, there was a big turning point where, um, and it was just after I left that one of these guys actually passed away. He made it to retirement. He talked mm. about for years that he was going to put the caravan on the car and they were going to travel Australia and all of these things, and he never got to do it. He never got to do it. And it was, and, you know, it broke my heart to think that this guy has done so much and he's never really got to live a life. And I thought, well, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person. And that mindset came in, I want to retire by the time I'm 40, you know, dreams, dreams. But <laughs> what can I do in order to achieve something different or what can I do at least to try and get to that benchmark or to try and have something um, or at least be out of the industry by that time because people do work really hard in this industry and they work long hours and they sacrifice so much and I just wanted to find something and I tried millions of different things don't worry but it's um <laughs> but yeah that that was that was that thought process I how do I actually get out of it so yes I wanted the progression and the career prog- progression because I loved it and enjoyed it then but I knew it wasn't forever either does that make yeah, sense that, or did I go off yeah, on tangents then <laughs> no I love tangents so it's good I'm writing a couple of things to go to go back to um We'll start with the the older guys and it really makes you realise that everyone needs mentors no matter what industry you're in, especially the young people but even not not so much young people because there's a lot of older people who are starting in mining especially and you you just need some people around you who are going to help and support you and say, it's okay, Mad Mumsy, come over here, I'll show you how to back in under the digger without getting abused you know, or at least try, you know, and I had some people on my journey that really did that. And for the older fellas that are out there and they're watching or listening, that's what I say a lot of the times is be one of those people, help them. Don't just get frustrated and angry and, you know, just, oh, dump it there because they're in the wrong spot or whatever. It doesn't help. You're not going to make them any better. And so many people start in the mines and then they just leave. They just see that, which is why I do what I do, Paul, because they just see the money, time off, and how hard can it be driving a bloody dump truck up a ramp? (sighs) You know, but that's all they know. And then they get a job in the mines and wonder why they struggle or they last for a couple of of months, some of them, and then they leave. So it's really important that we have mentors and for the older people that are still there to really help people through and – to see yourself as really valuable, you know, don't just sit at the crib heart and, and hold it in. Share what it is that you know. It's Absolutely. it's really important. It it I it you know, like it and then that guy that did all of that and then retired and oh. and then dies. Like that happened to my it's a common story, so I can share it. That happened to my dad's boss. When we, I remember when we were kids, and he said, "Bugger that! I'm I'm retiring when I'm 55," and he did. 
And they went off and they did laps around Australia. They went up the guts and turned left because they're in South Australia, up the guts and turned right. And then I think they went, you know, everywhere and now he's just retired. He did say he probably went a bit early, you know. (laughs) He didn't think he'd live this long. (laughs) So, um, but it's that sadly is something that happens, but it's also an important, I guess, that then moves into thinking about um, your exit strategy as well. Mm. Like how long do I want to be doing this? I know some old fellas out there, oh, well, I just got to stay here till I either die or retire because what else do I know? I don't know anything else, you know, and they've got no choice. And then they're working at the, at the, the dollar level, do you know what I'm trying to say? Like they have to live yeah. up to the the income because their lifestyle has grown with their income and so they can't afford to retire and go and just drive the grader at the council or something, probably wouldn't even pay the mortgage. So, yeah. you know, there's so many things that people just don't even consider at all. Oh, it, it is. It's horribly sad but you know and and then you've got the reality of that the people that work till that as well but they do they they don't have the mortgage they don't have the things yet they're still working to try and I don't know I don't know what it is it's the older school mentality but none of us younger people or none of us in general would be where we are if we didn't have the older mentors that were able to take Mm. the time and show us you know like from an apprentice you had a mentor that taught you how to hit a nail in for starters or you you know and it's it's passing that on and showing and giving new and better ways to do it so that people coming through can learn that you don't have to get it right but you can learn it and you can then put your own take on it to make it better and then pass that knowledge on as well and it's so important in in life in general not just in 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 work side of things um you know, we do it for everyone and then we can be the prick at work or people can be the prick at work. I'm not showing you, I'm not sharing, I'm not giving you, you know, that information. Learn it yourself, you know, learn it the hard way. Like, nah, come on. that's Like that's, I did. Yeah, learn it like I did. Yeah. Yeah, right I just got in a truck and I said, there you go, off you go. There's four <laughs> wheels, well, six, go. <laughs> yeah. oh, how many times I've heard that, you know. Um, and I love how you're bringing that back to life. Because it's not just mining, it's not just construction, it's not just FIFO, it's it's life. In as my sis, uh, my sister, my sister Hard Hat Mentor always says, it, it takes a village. You know, we need all these different people around us, and even as we're older, you know, like I'm now at that age where I'm more the mentor kind of person, but I still need mentoring from older people. I've got a couple of coaches and stuff. I need, I still need a bit of a pat on the back and a bit of a cuddle sometimes, you know, like you're all right, you can do this. So yep. we all need someone like that. And and if you haven't got that around you, it's really hard and and um, people really can struggle in this getting back to the FIFO journey. So they really can struggle. They get out there and they're stuck in a donga for two weeks at a time. They can't, they're not talking talking to anyone, they don't know anyone, they might be struggling. They, like there's so many things that can come up and sadly there's been lots of suicides. They've had, what, two su- inquiries into FIFO suicides. So is that before, I guess what I'm trying to say is what were your biggest challenges, Paul, when you were doing it but also what has inspired you to now go on and create all the things that you are now creating to help people because you've obviously seen it and felt it in your heart like I have. That's why I do what I do, but you're doing it on a, you know, in a different way as well, which is great because it takes a village, right? So yep. how did you get to that point where, well, bloody hell, I need to do a Facebook Live and I need to start a, I need to start a group and I need to help help some people, you know? Yeah, which you are. Great, it's a great question, and, and I guess, and I talk about overseas. So I I spent two years working over in Saudi Arabia, and when I talk about projects, it wasn't in mining. Then we were building a metro system over there in the middle of Saudi Arabia in Riyadh, and I went there 
because my kids at that stage had moved away. They were older. They were living with a mum. My son was older. He was living away and doing his own thing. Um, so I was only seeing the, them in the school holidays. So I was gifted an opportunity. I was asked to come over with the company I used to work with over there and take on this role. And I said yes without even thinking about it. Yes, and I saw I saw dollars and I saw an opportunity and I saw a lifestyle change, but I didn't see the realities of what it actually meant. And I did no research into why I was going, where I was going, or what I was going to be doing essentially. So hang on, I'm going to interrupt you there. So you got a job in Saudi Arabia and did no research? Absolutely zero. Didn't even know where it so was. So now this is, this is where Mad Mumsy swears, right? Like, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> like, what up with that, man? <laughs> Sorry, now oh. you make me go. <laughs> it's one of those things you say yes and work it out along the lines and um, hmm. it was probably the one time I probably should have said, yes, let me have a think about it. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't a quick thing. It was, you know, it took me eight months to be able to go through the process to be able to actually get there as well. So it wasn't a... It was, I had plenty of time to figure it out along the way. But uh, what I recognised when I got there it was that I'd stepped out of my comfort zone into a country that is probably one of the most restrictive in the world and mm. the reality of it is that it was intimidating, it was new, it was exciting, but I was shitting myself because I didn't, know how to fit into that culture and Mm. when I was essentially looking after so we're building a metro system I'm looking after one of the stations obviously with people above me and lots of people is a huge project and it's still going Um, but hundreds and hundreds of people on site with maybe a few percent of them that actually spoke English or English at all very well you know, so the reality of it was that majority of my engineers or whatever that I was working with were also my interpreters to speak Arabic and to do all these things. But And I went there and my roster was three months on and I was home for about 11 days by the time travel was taken out and all of those things. Three, three months on or 10 weeks on, two, two weeks off essentially, but, you know, give or take with the travel and blah, blah, blah. Nine months into that contract, and I had been working basically seven days a week, 15, 16, 17 hours a day, just feeling like a zombie and, you know, a little, a few breaks back and forth for the school holidays to see the kids. But I found myself crying in the corner of my cabin, just wondering, what the fuck have I got myself into? Where am I? What am I doing? And why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? I didn't know what was going on. I recognised it, but I didn't know what it was. But I was able to catch myself knowing because you go through all these trainings and you learn all these things, but you never actually learn it about yourself in a way that you can avoid it if you see the signs early. And it was one of those one of those moments where you just go, oh, fuck, if I don't change something, then the reality is, who knows? So it still wells me up to think about it, but that's the reality of it. But it was in that moment I went, if I'm feeling this and I've had a lot of training and I know this is happening, there's a lot of other people that are going through this as well. And I can change it, I can do something about it, but I have to change what I'm doing daily. I have to change what I'm doing on a consistent basis to turn the tide. And that was when I started implementing new things in order to change the, com- the reality of where, what I was facing. But And it's also that point of this is happening behind closed doors of the Donga and I was living in a camp environment over there. Um, but it was happy, smiley faces at work and happy, smiley faces at home. You know, mm-hmm. life's great. You know, I've, you know, you get paid every month and you think, okay, the pain goes away for that time. And then for those weeks leading up to payday, 
it creeps back into the point where you go, what am I doing? Then you get paid and you go, ah, oh, it's okay again. You know, and whether you get paid weekly, fortnightly or monthly, and it's so common in mining, that pain goes away every time you get paid because you see those dollars and you don't see the sense behind why you're doing it. And it really woke me up to what the realities were. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I could see, well, this is the power of video and this is why I, when I do do my podcast, they're always, I can see the person one way or another. But to be sharing this live and for those of you watching and in the replay as well, you can see and feel the emotion of you um, like curled up in your donga and crying in Saudi Arabia, like what the hell am I doing here? I, I could, I can mm. feel that. And so many people have that. I've had it in my truck and I've had blokes, blokes especially, which surprised me because like, oh, you know, I'm just an emotional wreck, that's me. But to have blokes contact me and say, I cry in my machine too. And hmm. it's it's real and we have all of these things now which are fantastic. Are you okay? Beyond Blue, Mates in Mining, Mates in Construction. There's so many support things out there that are about opening up and starting to acknowledge that and reach out if you need help. But there's still a lot of people, sadly, that don't. And yeah. they either just keep going and are miserable and hate it and, a, you know, no joy to be around either or, like you, put on a brave face for the crew and at the mess and on the bus and in the light vehicles and then go back to their donger and lose their shit and some of them just don't come out. And you've got family, there's kids, you would have been missing your kids as well so much, you know, and that's when it, when it comes to that I really can see that you got to a point where you recognised it so you like you say you'd had some training you had some tools in your toolkit to yep. to start to see it but a lot of people don't have that so you knew what boots you were starting to put on and went no nah, I'm not wearing those boots fuck them off Absolutely. like what ha, you know and you got yourself out of it Absolutely but one of the things that I used to and and you know we're running pre-start meetings and I'd have you know a couple hundred people from you know, India, Pakistan, Yemen, Egypt, Lebanon, all of mm. these people from mixed races that I'm standing in front of and I'm thinking, what the hell do you have to complain about? Why are you? You're talking to yourself. Yeah, why are you feeling this way when you're being paid bloody good money to be there and these people are being paid pittance to be there? They live away from home. For two years, they hand their contract, they hand their passport over when they get to the country. They live away from their family for two years at a time. Then they pay for their own flights to go home to visit their family for a month, and they come back and do it all again. What the hell have you got to complain about? And why are you feeling the way that they do? That 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 you are when these people turn up to work every day with a smile on their face, grateful for what they've got, not complaining very much at all. And I went to their camps and I went to their food halls and I saw how they lived and it was not nice and it wasn't right. But that's what they do. And, you know, there was a huge reality check moment there as well of that. It's like you need to do something better than this and you need to pull yourself out of this because you really don't have it bad. Yes, you're feeling the way you are and that's real and that's raw, but you can turn it around because you have, the ability, unlike these people, do to be able to do something about it. And do you also feel like you had a big why? Like, what was oh. your why? Was it? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Well, like, because it's really important to have a why. Why am I here? Why am I going to come out of this donger that I'm crying in? Why am I going to turn this around? What was your why, Paul? Well, there's always that in the back of your head, the kids, of course, but it's yeah. that what I wanted to show them was that no matter what stage of life you're at, you have the ability to change it. It's just a choice. You don't have to stay the way that you're feeling or thinking or acting. You can change that. 
and throughout the whole journey that had happened many times. But it got to that point where it was like, no. So I had to. And so you, did you have to break a contract to get out of it or you just you know what? I handed my <laughs> I handed my resignation in and I asked to leave <laughs> nine months before my contract was up. I signed a contract for two years. I said, I, I need to go. And they said, that's okay. We'll find a replacement. Well, the replacement turned up a month after I left, after I'd served my two years. So I pretty well served my two years and... <laughs> And and left almost to the date, and but it wasn't without lots of sacrifice and choice. And having those mentors, those coaches, I took on my own coach. I changed everything. I tried online marketing to be able to support, you know, to try and change my mindset. Personal development. I went down reading books and exercise and nutrition and all of these combination of factors of living in that foreign country of. It was all impacting in its own ways. And, mm. you know, there were so many different elements that I had to change in my own reality that accumulated to be able to turn it around. And, yeah, it wasn't easy. It wasn't. But it was a choice to go, no, you have to do something. I know a couple of times in my life I've been, you know, at the bottom of that cave, at the bottom of the well, looking up yep. and I'm like, I know what to do. I know I've got the tools. I know what I should be doing, but you know what? I don't want to. I just, mm. I'm not ready. I, well, I just, I don't care. I don't want to do it. I just want to stay here. I just want to feel sorry for myself. I just want to wallow for a while in the depths of all the things, you know. I just, um, and, then eventually, luckily, eventually, it started to turn around and then I I feel like I kind of, <laughs> like say you're on the in the bottom of a, a swimming pool and you're on the ground and then you go, yep. not on the ground, at the bottom of the pool and then you push up. <laughs> That's what I felt yep. like I did. But you sometimes you have to allow yourself to feel those things because I'm a positive, happy, nice, friendly person Sometimes I just needed to stay down there and get really mad because some shit was going on and get upset and you've got to feel, you've just got to feel it sometimes and a lot of people don't do that and then they'll snap at like it might seem like a smallest thing but it's been brewing and brewing and brewing but they haven't seen the signs. They haven't noticed what boots they were starting to put on and they didn't know how to get out. Um so is that the sort of thing that you share now, that you're yeah. starting to help others? Well, it is, and it's been a and it's been a journey in that stage, and that's where I started to create those Facebook pages. And it wasn't, and it started having those conversations with people back in Australia and all around the world of, you know, what are you, you know, what's going on for you? What I recognised was it was as much as it was helping them, it was helping me to heal and realise I wasn't alone and everyone yeah. else goes through these stuff as well. And it was, mm. you know, through the accumulation of trying different things and learning and reading and, you know, probably hundreds of audio books that I've now listened to, you know, in the personal development phase and that, you know, you've got a long time on a plane and, you know, it's almost a 22-hour journey by the time you go through airports and that to get back to Australia from over there. It's a long time. So you've got a lot of time on your hands to listen and read and do those things. But it started to fascinate me how that we can actually improve ourselves. And it never, you know, I thought it was all that old airy fairy stuff that, you know, oh, we all need help and personal development, woohoo, blah, 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 whatever. But <laughs> it's so important to, when you look at it, we go through it our whole life. We're always doing personal development. We've got our coaches as we, at sport, we've got mentors, we've got a traineeships, apprentices, you know, we've got people that teach us how to drive trucks, whatever it is. We're always being coached in the background. Mm. And I, and I took on my own coach for nine months that helped me get through that period. And, you know, he said to me back in that stage, why don't you share and help and do this for other people? And it, is, and it hasn't come easily. It's been a journey whilst I've been working that FIFO lifestyle for the last few years. 
and doing it of a night time and doing it on the side and all of these things. And then to now creating my own programs to share with people based on all of that lived experience and what other people have shared with me. And what I found was such a simple thing that I was getting so wrong. But when I changed it and when I implemented the things and went back to the basics and figured out that you can get it right if you just implement some s- simple th- tweaks into what you're doing. Mm. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, and it does <laughs> totally. It totally, totally, all of it. I'm just absorbing it <laughs> because I can see how you're growing in the space and how you're um, interacting and people are interacting with you and like in your Facebook group, what is it called? That the group successful with the um, families, successful five O families. I love it. And as a, I think it's every day, you at least once a day throw up a question, and um, I love the engagement that you're getting. And people are in there and they're they're talking about it. And um, you know, I usually come in every now and again and put my two bobs worth in as well. And I see Finny Pete in there the other yep. day. He's been on the podcast as well. I'll share the link yep. in the show notes, which can be found at madmunsey.com forward slash beers 74. And, um, yeah, it's really good. It's getting people thinking about, like I think one the other day was, what is the first thing you you would pack if you were going away if you when you're FIFO? And they're all yep. of the things. I like that some people had it like, I had a big massive list. That's not one thing. You know, I was trying to <laughs> narrow it down to one thing. I'm like this guy, he's got like 30 things. I could do that too, you know. It was funny. Um, yeah, so I said a pillow because I have oh, I remember working at this one band camp and I was on night shift and the pillow was literally like a slab of is it cement or concrete? I always get mixed up. <laughs> You know, Whichever one you want it to be. Cement's the product bag. that it turns into concrete, I guess. <laughs> right, so cement. So it's like a bag of cement that had gone hard and that was a pillow in my donger and I slept on it for one night and I was on night shift, so one day, and I had I could feel my neck getting stiff. I thought, I've got seven bloody nights out here. So I drove, that was around Moorumbah Way. I drove into Moorumbah, went into, what is it, Target Country and bought a pillow. <laughs> And I was like, oh, and from then on, I never, ever forgot my pillow. So that's why I put that in your Facebook group. But they're the sort of things that really get people thinking as well. It is, and that's in the the little guides I've gotten, things like that. It's the first thing. I mean, my pillow went all around the world with me. Like it's that (laughs) was because you know that you've got that one comfort item and you know that when you put your head down, you feel it's almost that safety, it's that comfort. You know that that's one thing that is yours and no one else can have. And it's that, mm. yeah, I never went anywhere, any camp without my own pillow. <laughs> yeah. So I love that And one. so do you take it on the plane as well or do you shove it in a bag or do you like carry it on the plane and lay on it? I've been pretty lucky that I've it? always, <laughs> well, I've always been lucky that I've had my own dongers I guess if you want to call it the long term and never really hot bedded or anything so Mm. I was able to leave stuff there so and that makes a huge difference so to those people that live the life of hot bedding and changing every every swing I take my hat off to you because that's that sucks let's be honest (laughs) I did it a couple of times when you go to you know short terms but no yeah yeah well I was spoiled for about nine years I had my own unit was a unit, not a donger, a unit like houses that had been split up into units. And then uh, I went to another band camp and I was hot seating in in a camp, not in town, and it'd take me bloody by the end of it, especially because I was starting to set up all of this. So I'd take my office with me as well as my stuff, (laughs) my teddy, my quilt, my, you know, all the things, (laughs) four bloody trips from the car and sometimes yeah. you don't get very close so I'm, I'm and one day there was this big kang I think I've shared this on the podcast there was this big kangaroo and it was lining me up it was bigger than me because I'm only five two or three or something and there was this guy waiting to get the bus out to work 
And he and he was the one who said, "You watch him. He's lining you up." Because I kept coming back with my <laughs> with my suitcase, or you know, my, my esky had to take a couple of beers with me. You know, so you have me one or two beers each night. So many things. So having a permanent room is just like gold yeah. nowadays. You know, and I, you never know I, I what room you're going to be in. It's shit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it. Should be one of the prerequisites for every camp. Give yeah, everyone absolutely. their own room and let them feel at home a little bit. Yeah, and at least, yes, you can hot bed. Like while you're on break, someone else can go in there, which a lot of them do. But at least you go to the same room and there's a locker in the room, like a wardrobe that locks up and you can leave so much of your stuff there, take your valuables yep. and that with you. You know, and you don't have to go and hand your key in every time and write in the thing and you know, and it's a 10-minute walk to the freaking office in the 40-degree heat in summer in central Queensland. You know, they're the sort of – and they they take a lot out of you and that's when you start saying, fuck this shit, I'm not doing this anymore. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to walk to the office and find out where I'm going. <laughs> I just want to go exactly. and get in my room and go to sleep because I've got to go to work in four hours, you know, for like your first night, stuff like that. So um, what sort of challenges do you – see in other people that you interact with uh, you know like we've spoken about yours what are some of the common things or whatever you would like to share I honestly think loneliness is a huge one but I think mm. the main one in that space is the uncertainty it's the uncertainty of you know you're always especially in the projects world and I can only relate to the projects world so but it's the uncertainty of is, you know, is the job going to end? When's it going to end? What's the next project look like? And it's the constant chasing. It's the constant, you know, is a subcontractor I'm working for? Are they doing a good job? Are we going to get kicked off? So there's always that in, inklings in the back of your head and there's always that fear-based mentality which creates the uncertainty because if I do the wrong thing, I'm on the window seat. If I, if, you know, if I, if I mess up, I'm going home, you know. And then all my dreams have, are gone out the window and sometimes they're not my fault but they could be my fault and I'm stressed out. And yeah, So that uncertainty around the lifestyle I think is such a huge element and it can tie into so mm. many different mini elements of that. Yeah, that's what I find definitely. Well, I have to agree with you there, especially at the moment with the contracting mentality in yep. in mining, you know, you can be escorted to the gate at any time. You can get a phone call on break or a text message. Your services are no longer required. And I get the only, if you call it a positive, is if you want to leave, you can do the same. Yeah, take me to the gate. I've had enough. I'm off. <laughs> you know, you don't have to give notice if you're, if you're permanent, if you've got another job or whatever. But And I know a lot of people that actually have done that. Yeah. enough of this shit I'm out of here take me I'm yeah. gone um but I was watching the mining inquiry the Queensland mining inquiry and it was into the gas build up in the undergrounds around here there'd been an explosion sadly but they kept coming back to the the us and them mentality between the contractors and the permanents and a lot of that had to do with are the contractors not speaking up about safety hazards and issues because for fear of losing their job or yeah. are speaking up? And it, it's a huge thing and it's out there and it's real. And I won't go into that too much because that was my last episode was me on a rant about mining inquiries. We just had another one and three or four years before I'd already done a podcast episode about the same thing and they've just done another bloody inquiry. Like, you know what to do. The outcomes are there. Stop so many contracting. Like, put on people permanent and do it properly, you know. There's, well, that in itself, um, without going into it as well, that fear-based mentality of, you know, rather than focusing on the reality of um, surviving, I'm focusing on the reality of I'm just going to lose my job. Now, what, you know, from mm. a safety point of view, what are you actually thinking about here? You, yeah, you know, not you're your job. About what you, <laughs> yeah. Yes, you want to be paid every week, but you're putting all of that at, at risk of 
yeah, it's a bigger picture. They people forget yeah. about the bigger picture a lot and very easily and very very quickly. And how easily it can come around. You know, there's been times other band camps I've been at and we all knew that people were going to get put off today and there's a list and when's yep. the list coming out? In the meantime, off you all go to work, stay safe, yep. <laughs> do the right thing, mind on the job, you know, jolly good. Like <laughs> everyone's thinking about, oh, who do you think is going to go? And then they put people off and everyone's like, oh, you know, how come he went and this person is still here? So yeah, it exactly. really changes you. Oh, man, that's huge. It changes the crew culture and how your crew culture is has a lot to do with your mindset as well and your mentality. If you're on a good crew, you can put up with most shit. If you're on a if you're on a crew that is divided and gossip and potting each other in and all the things, it's it's a bad place and you do that's another thing you do not want to go. You don't want to go when it's like that. Yeah, and it's it's and it's exactly the same in projects. It's you know, you've got it just filters through so quickly, doesn't it? That it's if it's a, if it's mm. a good scene, it's a great project. If you got that yeah. bad scene happening, it turns into a shit project. And and I can only imagine that, you know, for you people yeah. playing in the big Tonka trucks all the time, it's um, it's not a place you want to play with when people are in a shitty mood. You know, dodge them cars in those aren't real good. No, no, that's right. And here in Queensland, we've had a lot of actual deaths recently. Yeah. So that, and a lot of this came out in that. So it's real, you know, and that's where Steel Cap Sisters really was born, was over that, you know, hashtag yeah. one minute for our lost miners. And we just had to keep adding bloody helmets and candles and Steel Cap boots to the graphic that I created. Like, you could, yeah. like what, there's another one. This is ridiculous. So, and this is why I do what I do. And I know it's why you do what you do, just so people can see inside the industry, see inside the, like, for you working away from home, what sort of thing, you know, to expect, how can you make it work, things like that. And for me, it's a sort of, it's just, I just say how it can be and how it is, and which is, what isn't really told at inductions and stuff, you know, they don't they don't talk like that. No, and it's not about I don't want to put the fear of the industry into anyone because it's not about that. It's a great industry if you do it the right way. And you can make mm. you can make the industry such a success for yourself if you set it up correctly and you do it the right way and you listen and you learn and you and you try different things as well because What's necessarily being done and has been done for the last ten years has been is proving that it's you know, it's not working because there's lots of things still going wrong, and mm. people sacrifice so much for this industry that the job's so much more important than life itself and their families and their friends and all of these things because they're chasing a dollar to ultimately set themselves up for a lifestyle that they want for their families to have these things, yet they're not in not really recognising what the impact of it can create if it's not done correctly as well. Now, if you can blend that together, if you can create it in a way that allows you to have that balance in FIFO or Dido or whatever it is in this in this industry and at home, you can do it for the right reasons, you can do it for a shorter time and you can get the results that you want and you can't do that unless you're specific about why you're doing it. Yeah. Always start with your why. That's right. And you're also, I'm glad that you brought that up, is that not everyone struggles. Not everyone no. has issues with crews. Not everyone gets abused. Not everyone. So, you know, there are people that make it work or that it just naturally works for or they are naturally doing the sort of things that we're talking about, you know. So it's important to realise that you can definitely have a successful, exciting life doing the FIFO and doing mining. It, it, there's so many, well, thousands of people that do it for years and years and they're not just doing yeah. it because they have to because they got the golden handcuffs on. They're, you know, uh, they're doing it because they actually enjoy it. 
there's a yeah, lot of people that do that. Mm, that's right. And it's important to remember that. It really is because a lot of people focus on the negative and um, that's why I try to get a, a good variety of people on the podcast as well is to let's just talk about let's just tell let's just tell some stories, fun things. And then there's others, you know, where we go a bit deeper and even in the even in the fun ones who are, you know, I'm just a dozer driver and yeah. yeah. This is my story. There's usually a little bit of the the challenge that they had and how they overcome it and, and stuff. So it's it's really good that there's a lot of people that are talking about it all now and it's more open. It's being seen to be more open and welcoming. If you are struggling, there's help. Reach out. You know, and if you're listening now and you're you're struggling, please we you know, if this has brought anything up for you, um, I'm sure, Paul, you'd agree that we really encourage you to reach out to the support oh, yeah. systems that are out there. Yeah. Firstly, ring your family and friends, and if that's not it, that's, you know, take it to that next level. It's so important. You may just need to yeah. chat, get it off your chest. And it is, and I think that, you know, there's, there's so many elements to it, and no one can do it the same way as the person next to them. It's so individualized mm. that, and this is what I try and share and teach with people and, and, and help them on, is that you have to do it what works for you and you have to be so specific as to why you're doing it. You have to, and I, I want to share this, what this is behind me because this is what Please this do. is. And it's, this is, you know, it's, it's you have to I'm have I'm just going to interrupt. I'm just going to interrupt because for the podcast they can't see the video. So oh, Paul is pointing at a whiteboard <laughs> that is behind him with something written in the middle and then circles around the outside. I will actually, if you can take a picture of that and share it, I'll put it in the show notes, madmubsy.com forward slash beer 74 but I'm sure you'll be able to explain it anyway. I just want to share that the, the, the six key elements that I have found that work not only for me and what allowed me to, to to change everything, and don't get me wrong, I still got it wrong, but what I recognise is that <laughs> if you can do these things 80% of the time well, then you can be successful. And and I will go into how that journey for me in FIFO ended as well because I still got it wrong right till the last day. So, But you can still, if you set it up correctly and you put, and this is it. So the number one thing I share with people in these six key elements is you have to have your plan and you have to be specific about it. You then have to prepare yourself for why you're going, where you're going and what you're going to be doing. You have to create a structure that works for you. You have to create a routine that works for you. Again, they both have to be individualised. Then you mm -hmm. need to create the routine we've talked about, then you need to implement the steps that you said that you were going to do for yourself. And then you need to tie that together with a balance, not only in your camp life, but in your home life. And when you bring that whole piece together, those six key elements, and you get those right. And from a family point of view, if you do this together and create it together, then you will get the success that you want and you'll do it the right way. And when those times of toughness come up, you'll both be able to call on each other to remind yourself why you're doing it and how you're doing it, what you discussed as a family because at the end of the day, and I go back to the building the houses time and bringing it all together, what I saw so often is that these beautiful homes that we were building, people weren't living in them because they were so busy, they were so far away from home, they were mm. um, you know, not spending their time there because they're so busy working whether they're in this industry or they're working locally. They were so busy working that they weren't enjoying their time and the separation of the families became such a reality and it, it just all pieced together for me that, you know, we do all these things to set ourselves up for success yet in the background we're actually going so far away from what we're actually trying to create for ourselves because we forget about the reasons why we're doing it and the simple things. If we can do that, we can bring that harmonious family life together and create a lifestyle and create the success that we want for ourselves and our families. That's ultimately why we're doing it. Boom. Drop the mic. <laughs> that, that was gold. Thank you. That's that's a really um, 
a, a wonderful way that you've you've outlined it to balance it all, like your plan, prepare, just move your head to the left. <laughs> plan, prepare, structure, routine, implement, balance, and plan. We're back up the top. And that equals FIFO success. Exactly. I love it. Yeah. That, yeah. And, and it makes what we sense. Want. Mm. It is. Otherwise, why are you doing it? You don't go there why to, are you doing to it? fail. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's it. We don't want people to fail. We want people to have the success for the sacrifice that they're making, not only for their family but their friends and everything else around them. You know, they, you give up so mm. much. You know, you, you've done it. You've given up so much. You've missed out on so much. Yes, you may have gained from it but make it for the right reasons. That's it and you don't want like you might be enjoying going out to work but your family isn't enjoying you being there so it it there's so many different areas that can succeed and yet others fail on both sides mm. on all the different areas so that's something else to think about as well you've got to yeah and that's why i love those six key elements there really get everyone around the table, guts on the table, how are we going to make this work? And that's why I created the program that I've created and I've got it all online now. I've put it onto a platform where it can all be done online as well and I get to to see people succeed and I get to see people have those little moments where they go, oh, shit, I just need to tweak it. And it's not about being wrong. It's just about tweaking a little bit sometimes yeah. in order to get a better result. And those little moments like, oh, yes, now it makes sense. Now if I just do this and it's, yeah, because you don't want people to get to a place that you've been yourself. And if they can, and that's the thing that frustrates me about all of the amazing companies and things out there bringing awareness to this industry it's all still reactive what mm. i need and what i want is for people to be proactive about why they're doing it and how they're setting it up so they don't need those services what those services yeah. are a last resort why are we so many people getting to that point where they need those services there's obviously mm. failure so far before that and if anyone's been through mining five wires or timelines and accidents and things, why are we getting to that point? Because there's so many fundamental issues because people aren't either in the right headspace, they haven't planned, they haven't prepared, they haven't done any of these things correctly, and the outcome is they need an EAP service or something like that. People mm. are still going to slip through the cracks and that's going to be there. They're in an important service, don't get me wrong. But we need to be proactive as opposed to being reactive. And, that's- yeah, I totally, totally on board with you there too, Paul. It, and it's it goes right back even at, at like as far as before they even get the job to know yep. what they're in for, to know what to expect, to know what the camp's like, to know, you know, I, I, I mentor people when I get them, well, I got a job, yay, finally, okay, yeah. So and they, it, they're leaving tomorrow and they hardly know anything. Are yep. you serious? We've had all these inquiries and it, as so much of it is supposed to be about People knowing what they're in for, knowing what to expect so that they can plan for it. Is there internet? Like there's so many exactly. Facebook groups about uh, mining camps and you go in there and all the questions are, is there internet there? Is there a gym? Is there is there a this? How do you get there? What's it like? Is it shit food? Blah, blah, blah. And if you didn't know that, just find them on Facebook because they're quite interesting to have a look at <laughs> and there'll be varying degrees. Some people love it, some people hate it or it used to be shit and now it's good or the other way around. But um, they're the sort of things that the people that hire you should be doing more and that's where as Mad Mumsy, I, I, it hasn't happened yet, but I'd really like to get more into the going along to induction days and stuff or creating I've already created some stuff for my peeps as well but 
just so they know what they're in for and what to take to camp. You know, they don't they don't give you things like that. You might get a pretty little brochure that this big contractor has printed off that everyone gets, but they don't know all the little things. You know, you need to know more, and that's why I believe my podcast speaks to people, you know, because and you know what you're doing and other people's podcasts like Finney Pete's he's he's talking to miners and stuff um full production his podcast yep. I think yep, yep. <coughs> excuse me yeah Lockie so, Samuel's doing great things over there now in WA with Happiness Co and doing his tour at the moment around you know there so many people you know Dan Hunt with his mental health movement and all of these people yes. are doing amazing things they're all fantastic people in their own right and doing incredible things into an industry that obviously needs so much help and we can't and you Mm. talk about the village and you talk about we need to do it as a combined effort and we can all do it and all these little elements bring together what people will take out of these things what they need to take out of and it might be a snippet from every single person but if those people aren't sharing it they'll never get it and that's what's so important about yourself and everyone else collectively are doing their own little bit to try and just improve it because all mm. of these people have had experiences that haven't necess- they haven't all been bad. There's been some bad ones along the line, but there's been some yeah. amazing things come out of it as well. You know, yeah. through our through our mess becomes our message is some, one of those biggest things, and it's so important that we actually share that. Because yeah. if my son was going and he's 22 and he has considered it, you know, he's a hydraulic mm. hose fitter, he's an apprentice. I said, mate, you're not ready for it. You, this isn't for you at the moment. You you mm. you don't want to go there now. Like, and I want people to know that someone out there would look after my son and tell them what they need to know and need to hear so they make a choice that's right for them because so many people are out there for the wrong reasons, without the experience, without knowing what they're doing, and they're the ones that get themselves into trouble and find out, you know, and then families have to deal with the consequences. We don't need mm. people to go there if they're not a right fit for it. That's, and, yeah. and you talk about the induction, the screening stage of it. I totally agree 100% that these are the sorts of things that we need to do at an earlier stage so people that aren't fit for the industry don't end up there. It's as simple as that. Mm. Yeah. My first section of my course, Pounce, how to get a job as a dump truck operator, and it's got nearly a 1,000 people that have signed up to that now, and it's free. I've got a little ad on Facebook, you know, stop the Google search, just how do I get a job in the mines? Well, come here, have a look at this. I'll leave it in the show notes, a link to it. Um, But the whole first section is about questions to ask yourself and your family. What are you prepared to do? What aren't you prepared to do? To Because some people say, I'll do anything just to get a job in the mines. Well, anything? Like, really? <laughs> like, what's your anything? There's lines. Yeah. Or maybe you don't have any lines and that's fine. And so the first whole section, at the end of it, I say, and you might get to this point and decide, mm, yeah, no, it's not really for me. You know, like you started this podcast about, oh, <laughs> I'd love a job, but I don't think I'd pass a drug test just yet. You know, yeah. I've had a lot of friends and like, oh, yeah, no, no bugger that. You know, or you might miss the grand final. Your football team's in the grand final, first time, never made it. You're, you're, you won't even hear it. Oh, fuck that. You know, so there's yeah. so many different <laughs> things that people don't even think about. Are you prepared to miss birthdays and Christmas and stuff? Yes, and there funerals. is lots of good things, but there's – and funerals, yes. And 2020 is the year that people are realising just how much we we miss things like that um, yep. because we can't go. And sometimes the amount of times I've been stuck in a bloody coal mine in the middle of Queensland and I've got one of my kids on the, on the phone when I'm at the crib up bawling their eyes out, I just need a hug, Mum, and I can't be there. I'm not there. Stuck in the middle of a fucking coal mine again. Yep. I was always out there when something happens, and that's something that they say too, you know. If something's going to break, it will happen when the partner's out at work, you know. But 
I don't want to dwell on the on the bad things because there's a lot of good things. And the crew becomes your family. Like I've got great mates. I've got so many wonderful memories of dressing up at Christmas and going because, you know, we worked Christmas yeah. <laughs> and um, decorating my truck and I've got so many good stories, which had a lot to do with why I I stayed for so long and a lot of people do. You find the good bits between the shit bits is one of Mad Mumsy's sayings and um, then hopefully the good bits grow and the shit bits start to dwindle as you start to notice and understand yourself and how you're reacting and what boots you've got on in that situation, mm. right? I know I don't get on with that guy. So don't go and sit next to him at the crib art because you know you're going to have an argument over whatever, football, politics, whatever. Just don't go there. Okay, I'll exactly. go out and sit out here. Oh, I found a new friend. So there's so many things like that that can help you get through. Absolutely, you, you you just and you you talk about it, you know. Find your tribe, and it's just mm. being that. It's and it is. It's so important, and that's a huge part of it. Just avoid the negative, bloody people out there, because you can make it a success. Yes, people go through challenges. People go through so many different things. But if you have that understanding, you have all those fundamentals in the background that are working for you, you can truly make it a success. And you're going to get it wrong along the lines too. And as I said, I was going to Mm. share with you right up until the point, and I stepped away from FIFO in June this year, June, July. Now, that was a forced exit. Now, I had, a, I had my plan in place. I'd implement stuff. So over the last three years since I've been doing this and sharing this and really honing in on this, I had everything in place and I had a goal to be out of there by the 1st of September. Family, we had decided that was enough. We had done what we needed to do. We, we had specific things. We'd achieved what we wanted to achieve. We'd put a time frame on it, the 1st of September because it was spring, new season, all of these things, you know, it's, this is us. So four weeks and I let my guard down. Yeah. And four weeks yeah. before that, I let my guard down. And for the first time ever, I blew numbers. So my choice was taken away from me. So we went out and had a bit of a work function. And yeah. I didn't have to I didn't have to log in that day. I didn't have to go to work that day. It was fly out day, so I was only there for a few hours anyway. My office was mm. off site, so I didn't actually have to swipe in. I could have gone to the office and still pretended to be at work and all of those things, something in that I had a key to every gate on the external property boundary. So I could have got into the mine no matter how, what it wanted. Something said to me that day that you just need to swipe on and it, it is what it is, you know. No, don't be like that. Don't be those people. And blue numbers. And in that moment, it was whilst it was disappointment that I'd let myself down. It was the biggest relief that had ever happened. It was like when the parrot or the nurse or whatever, she said, that's not a good result. I said, no, that's the best result I've ever had because now I finally get to go home, have my family and do what I want to do. And now I'm doing it. And it's it was so good. Such a relief for me. Wow. I can feel your emotion there at the end. It's the, I say, it's the universe doing its shit. And Absolutely. your little voice, your little voice said, "No, oh, for some reason I'm going. I'm going." Yep. And then that, like you say, that made it happen. It, it's wow. Oh, Best thank you for sharing happened. that with us. Yeah, and it it makes you now, even though you had a plan. So, how far ahead of the plan of exiting were you when we, that happened? We had- we had the things in place that we wanted to have in place. You know, I've got the house, we've got an investment property, we have our cars, you know, we have those little things that, you know, so many people never get. And, yeah, you know, whilst you may not own them outright, you have those things and you have that stuff implemented for yourself to allow you to set yourself up and that's why you're there. You're there to set yourself up to make the later years that little bit easier. And, mm. you know, and I'm – whilst I never really shared those things that 
you know, I have because I, it's not about that show pony stuff that you'd be able to, you know, but there's a lot of sacrifice behind the scenes to be able to get that. And for the people out there that have those things, be proud because you've earned them. Be proud because you've sacrificed for them. And, but don't take it for granted because, you know, there's mm-hmm. a lot of people out there that are doing it really tough as well that don't have those things. So it's not about having the ego attached to it, just having that pride attached to it in the sense that you can be, um, yeah, you can just actually go and enjoy them more really. And that's, that's what it's about. And, you know, to be home because I missed all of that stuff with my own kids, now to be in a new relationship with, you know, the twin boys that, you know, not mine biologically but been with for three years now, I get to go back to that time where I'd missed out on the kids at that 10 to, you know, mm. that 10-year-old sort of mark. And it's like it's, it's like that second chance again but it was like, no, I'm not going to be away. I'm not going to do those things again. I don't want to live away from home anymore. I want to have a family. I want to be home. And that was my plan. All I ever wanted to do was have that plan in place so I could be home and have a family. And that was that was my goal. Now I get to share what I love doing so other people can have what they want as well, whatever it may look like for them. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's I, as you were saying that, I was thinking about the people that have just started in mining and, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get a new car and I'm going to go to Thailand for a holiday and I'm going to do, well, you can't really do that so much these days. But, you know, I'm a rich miner now and I, I went through that myself. I was like the rich miner who paid for everyone's everything. Yep. Um, but I should have kept a lot more of it for myself to pay off that mortgage and, and stuff instead mm. of hiring a convert- convertible in the best unit at Malula Bar and, you know, all of those things. Like, well, and it was good because I'd never had it and I was starting yeah. again. So it was really good for me to have that for a, for a few years. But then in hindsight, when you look back, so but just for the people – that are new, especially in this climate of mining, um, the it can be taken away from you at any time. So make the most of it and um, don't just assume that you're always going to be on that money because anything can happen, you know. So um, make the most of it, do good with it. Whatever your good is, it might not be the mortgage and the car and, and stuff. Yeah. It might, it might be... Your good is experiences, like going on holidays. That's why you're there. If that's your why, do that. You know, but just exactly. really be aware that it can be taken away at any time. Now for a word from our sponsor, Julia Hartman and the Bantax Accounting Group. Julia's my awesome accountant. She's written two books with financial expert Noel Whitaker. And she's got a passion to help us miners make the most out of our hard-earned cash. She's got heaps of tips and make sure that we get every cent we are meant to get and is right on the ball with everything. If you head to bantax.com.au forward slash miners, that's B-A-N-T-A-C-S, you can download a free booklet all just for us miners And there's also a spreadsheet in there that helps you check off what tools you have for your trade, like your isolation lock, work boots, seven shirts, all of these sorts of things. And you can weigh them up and it'll tell you if you qualify weight wise to claim your trips out to work. And that's just one of the things that they've got over there. So I strongly urge you to head to bantax.com.au forward slash miners and see what they can do and find your nearest office as we come up to tax time. They're really on the ball, know what's going on with the tax department and there's heaps of other free information like property investing. If you really plan on doing some great things with your money, you want to do that, right? If you want to sell your house, can save a lot of money if you find out what to do first rather than in hindsight. And Julia, she'll, you know, make sure you get it right. And if you do it wrong and then go and see her, she'll <laughs> she'll up you <laughs> in the nicest possible way because she really cares about us and wants us to keep our money and not give it to the tax department. Anyway, head over to bantax.com.au forward slash miners and tell them had Mumsy sent you.
and it, and that's going to change. And what what I love about the way I've created the program that I've got and share is that I say to people reassess every single roster because that dynamics is ever so changing, and your reasonings for being there will change as well along the lines. Your age will change, so your dynamics of what you actually want in life will change. You know, you might mm. have a new relationship. You might have a sickness at home that things change. So you have to be able to consistently reassess why you're there and not just take it for granted that it's just going to be there, as you say, because, yeah, those places can shut down overnight and you'll have be left guessing. And that's the uncertainty that we spoke about earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. All right. I might just uh we might start thinking about wrapping up. We've gone an hour and a half. <laughs> so we could chat um, this, couldn't we? Yeah, well we yeah. could and I have before, which yeah. is why some of my you know, and that's the beauty of podcasts is they can go as long as they need to be, really. Because you can listen to it on the plane and then when you get off the plane you stop. And then when you doing that walk, unpacking your stuff <laughs> to your donger, four trips, yep. dodging kangaroos <laughs> in the heat, exactly. going to get your key. You can still be listening to that podcast again. So I've I've been uh, in a few podcast groups and they all say, oh, you no, they shouldn't be longer than 45 minutes because that's a 45-minute commute. Like the people that listen to my podcast, they're working 14, 15, 16 hour days and it takes them a whole day to get to work even when they're, get on the way yeah. one four hour podcast is just between first and second crib man you know <laughs> in, <laughs> exactly. in the truck. I love the long ones so yeah um but we might just lighten up a bit and yeah, have you got anything sure. else that you want to say about all, all that I've just got a couple of quick light questions to wrap up uh, with if you're ready no for sure go for it all right um, do you have any tips for dealing with night shift or have you done night shift when you were Doing all I have that. done night shift. I hate it. Um, <laughs> I think it's wrong in every element. It's wrong. But, oh, well, you know, if beers are allowed, you can have a couple of quick beers. Not the best way, though, when you're sleeping through the day and <laughs> yeah. you know it's hot and sweaty and the air conditioner rattles and the dust is coming through the aircon and all of those things. Ear, earplugs are a good one. Um, mm-hmm. not not earphones because, as we know, they can catch on fire in your bed and that's not a nice way to wake up. But, um, oh, can yeah. they? Ooh. Yeah. Haven't you seen that when you – anyway. No. And your, char- and your charges can overheat under the pillows and all those things. I really did learn to listen to um, some of the meditation apps and the sleep apps and things like that, and I did, yeah. I did, I did find them actually – well, so were really weird to start with, and it's like, God, this is you know, what's going on? But I Bit learned woo-woo. to like them, and <laughs> yeah, and just listen to you know, yeah, a book or something, read a book and go to sleep. You know, there's so many different things, and it's everyone's different. You just have to find something that works and keep yeah. trying something different until you find something that works for you. And if you can yeah. avoid night shift, do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it changes. Like you can go from day to day, I've got a great sleep, and then yep. next day, no sleep. So don't beat yourself up. And my biggest tip is don't beat yourself up because you're not asleep. Oh, yeah. God, I've got to go to sleep. I've got to get up in two hours. I've got to go, I've got to, go to sleep. Well, you're not going to go to sleep feeling like that. I say, no. especially that first day when you're going out for night shift, so you haven't even done night shift yet, and you've rocked out to camp about lunchtime, drive, drive in, drive out, peep kind of person and you just you just rock up and you got to try and get a few hours in however you can I used to say well I'm in bed I got my jammies on I got my pillow I got my teddies and to me that's sleeping that's yeah. what I started telling my brain so but like you say it's different for everyone it changed over the years I was listening to those um uh meditation apps my favorite I still do now is calm the calm app they have sleep oh, yeah. stories and I never get to the end, whereas my daughter doesn't like listening to them because she needs to hear the end of the story so it keeps her awake. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's great cool. ones. There's, you know, there's some sleep cycle, cycle apps and things like yeah, that, I had you know, eight-hour sleep yeah. cycle. And, and I found them good and I found them really great on the plane, especially when you're on the plane for 
longer than eight hours. Mm. So it was always oh, good. Stuff. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, okay, what do you do with your old PPE? Hard hats, high vis shirts, steel cap boots? I always try and keep a pair of boots because they're always yep. good for mowing the lawn and, and doing stuff. Um, PPE, I've got a bag full of pants. I tend to throw the shirts out and leave them there. I don't know how many places I've left and, you know, there's all the shirts and there's all the jackets and all of that because you can only have so many fishing jackets. You only need, you know, one or two. <laughs> but, um, yeah, most of them don't like you giving them to the St. Vinnie's or anything like that, which is such a shame. So, yeah, I just I yeah. leave them because I don't need the luggage weight. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, because you're flying from overseas. That's got a lot to do with it as well. I've got a mountain of um, uh, high-vis that I just – and I've got all different sizes because, you know, you've got to have your fat days and your skinny days and this new style yep. came out and all of that back in the day when I was permanent and you got a new issue every year. They don't do that so much anymore. So, yeah, my mum uh, used to make – hard hat pot plants, so hang the hard hats upside down and put petunias in them on the veranda. And I have planted herbs in steel cap boots before in my garden. I've still got my original old ones. (laughs) Speaking of steel cap boots, have have you got any stories around steel cap boots? Have you ever found any critters in them or know anyone that has? Like what sort of critters do they have in bloody Saudi Arabia? Uh, well, there are scorpions over there, but I never found that. Oh. You wouldn't you wouldn't leave your stuff outside because, I mean, feral cats over there are probably the worst thing. They're everywhere. Um, be crying under your dongers and whinging and fighting and scratching and uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and for all the cat lovers out there, well, fair play to you, but I'm not a cat fan, and these things were yeah. Anyway, let's not go there, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I've heard the stories for me personally, you know, the odd spider and that that you've, well, what's that? But, yeah, nothing too too dramatic really or a, oh, maybe a pair okay, of socks you've, cool. left there for a, you've left there for a week and forgot to wash because they were stuffed so far in your boot. And but, you yeah, didn't know no, they were nothing. in there. <laughs> yeah, oh, nothing that's too cool. bad. Yeah. yeah, that's something that I ask in uh, – Dione, hard hat mentor, always says, now remember when you check your boots, think about it. How are you going to check your boots? You're going to stick your hand in there to see if anything's going to bite your foot. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And <it's, laughs> yeah, and I'm like, Put them upside what? down. Oh, it's, shit, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's always right. a bit of a ritual, uh, I suppose, that you tip them up before you put them on because, you know, you always get that loose little pebbly rocks and shitty things. You put them on, you go, oh, yeah, yeah take them off again. Yeah. Yeah, and they're not easy to unless you've got the zip lace. The zip sides are the zip. best. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, I worked with a fellow who had a, a green tree frog in there but didn't know, and <laughs> it was just annoying him and he was driving a digger and he couldn't just stop. And then at Cribby, he'd come and got it out and he's like, bloody hell, it's a frog. <laughs> and so I, I love frogs. And so I, he didn't care. He's like. It just annoyed me all morning. Um, and so I went and got it. It was all feral and crispy and drying up, but it wasn't bad. And I took it over and I put a bit of water on it, found a plant, put it in a plant. Oh, my God. So you never know how what you're you going to get. But How do you know those things aren't in your boot? Like, like yeah. I feel well, it's the squished right rock. up in. Yeah. Yeah, but it's soft and squishy and it's kind, he kind <laughs> of thought it was like his sock wasn't on right. You know, like what have we done? It's just it was just yeah, exactly. It was a bloody it was a frog. (laughs) What is your special place when life turns to shit? How do you personally handle tough times? Your strategies to hang in there? Oh yeah, that's a that's a good question. And it used to be anger, frustration, and you know, and then it was the guilt and regret and everything attached to it. But now, you know, after being through so many different programs and learning so much about myself over the last few years, it's being able to recognise those things when they come up and going, no, it's just that. Yes, those things still come up. You still get the frustration. But what I recognise the most is that in, in my own personal life is that 
I need to have those go-to things and I talk about the balance a lot and it's the most crucial element and finding those things that you love so you don't get your, yourself to those places as often. For me, it's I love the water. So, you know, I love surfing. I love scuba diving. I love all those things. And I know that if I get up, and which I do quite regularly now, and I'm at the beach at 5 o'clock in the morning for a surf and I only need to go for an hour or whatever before the kids get up and can do those things, but you have to find something for yourself. Mm. You have to find that balance. Whilst you're in camp, you need to find something that you can do as you release, whether it's the gym, it's a bit of exercise, it's a podcast, it's a book, whatever it looks like, and then you have to find what it is for you at home as well. When you can do that, you don't get to that level of that it's just work, work, work. It's that it's that balance. So yeah, find that thing that you love and, and do it more regularly. You'll go a long way to uh enjoying what you're doing more. Thank you. I love that. It's uh all about putting on your me time boots, isn't it? Massively. As Steel Cap sisters would say, yeah. It's huge and it's really something that we can forget. I haven't got time for that. I haven't got time to do the thing that I really like to do, you know. So it's a very important message, I think. Thank make you for sharing time. that. Yes, make the time. So in closing, do you have anything else that you're super excited about right now that you'd like to share with us? I'm super excited coming into next year because I am wanting to get out to sites and actually, you know, share with companies and share my message from a different point of view. I don't believe anyone's sharing it from the same angle that I, I like to share. You know, you obviously are doing lots of things similar and there's lots of people out there doing their own ways. And no, I'd love to see how everyone could do something together as well. That would be amazing. <laughs> that would um, be awesome. Yeah. That would be amazing. But yeah, look, there is have big dreams in, in coming into twenty twenty one to be able to really share that message loud and clear and and widely to help those families out there. And and this year has been so tough for so many. And it's mm. it's I'm sure there'd be a lot of people out there reconsidering what their FIFO journey looks like and what their structure looks like going forward. And, you know, if, if, if there's anyone out there, um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be working or doing my program and it simply can be a chat to, to and maybe some new ideas to, to help those people out there so they make it make it work for them. So, yeah, there's, there's lots in the pipeline um, and I am excited about it because, you just never know where it can go and those conversations that you can have. So, And those people yeah. that you meet and learn from them as well and go, oh, shit, I didn't have it so bad after all. Yeah, yeah. And, like, everyone is so looking forward to next year. Be gone 2020. <laughs> but I remember saying that I was talking about this with mum. I remember saying that about, I think, 2017, 2018. <laughs> 20, you know, <laughs> there was stuff going on like, well, we'll just write that year off, but little did we know about this year. So yeah. surely it's got to improve. But I think that it has been a really big time for everyone to reassess and reflect and just just look at the things that they're doing. I know a lot in my life has changed um, this year because of COVID, you know, a few forced changes and it's worked out better for me where I'm at. So um Obviously, it hasn't for a lot of other people as well, and we just really hope that it well gets this sorted real fast, and everyone can yeah. get back on track. Yeah, and exactly, yeah. bring on twenty twenty one, and hopefully, you will be out on site somewhere soon, and people can you know be sitting there and go, I remember watching him on Mad Mumsy's Facebook page. <laughs> Hopefully. Ah, for sure. I'd love to get out yeah. there and meet some people and, and, and share a bit more and, you know, help them in some way because I, th I so many people gave me the time of day and the opportunities to, to, to make my journey a success as hard as it was in periods of that. But, and without those people, I wouldn't be able to get to share my message. So if I don't share that, then that would be selfish and, you know, 
people mm. need to understand that you're going to have tough times, but you can you can make it easy for yourself, and you can certainly turn it around and and still make it a success. So never give up. Oh, I love that! What a great way to finish. Never give up. Uh, where can people get in touch with you, Paul? Yeah, What's well, there's the best the, way? the successful FIFO families group on Facebook. It's um it's only a fairly new group, so starting to build that up. So you're welcome to come and join us there. Uh, my website is um, just www.paulsmithcoach.com. Very simple. I'll share all the links to you in the show notes, madmumsy.com forward slash beers74. So, I and that. because, well, you know, you're doing so much and I want to help you as much as I can. And so it's all, we're all intertwined, us. Us, us lot. <laughs> we're all helping each oh, other, it seems, and it's and it's really good. It, and because we're and all doing it, we've all got the right why, you know. I believe, and we're all doing it differently. But we can't all say yeah. do it alone. There's so many people out there that just need to hear a different message or the same message from a different person. And that's right. That's the most important thing for people out there. If my message doesn't resonate, go and find someone's message that does because someone will be sharing what you need to hear and it may just be what you need to hear today and that's the most important thing. Oh, that's gold. And because I know there's a lot of people that don't resonate with me, mad mumsy, bloody drinking beer and all that, like they're a bit too, they're a bit whatever for that. You know, I'm a bit, I'm a bit out there. And there's other people that aren't, they're a bit more, I don't want to. I don't want to put names on things, but ex- exactly what you said. How we resonate with different people. It's like yep. diets. You hear, you, we all know what we have to do, but oh, I need to hear it from this person. I'm really relating to how they're helping to motivate me to make change, and I feel like that's what we're all doing in, in all the different different ways, so that people can try us all out and see which one or all of us might fit, you know. Does any of that make sense? Oh, there's a bit of a rant. <laughs> yeah, it does, but it, and it's no one needs to think that they're broken either because sometimes mm, all we need good. is is to shift the perspective just slightly to get a totally different result. So never feel mm. that you're in such a place that it's unachievable because you'll hear the right message and you'll be able to shift that couple of millimetre and then you'll be on your way back to achieving what you want to achieve and it's as it is as simple as that but you just have to find that what works for you beautiful just cut a little tweaks that's all we need cut sometimes isn't tweaks. it that's couple it. of tweaks all right on that note if you're ready we might say goodbye now because i know we could chat all day and i have been known to all the links we discussed in this episode are at madmumsy.com forward slash beers 74 and thank you so much paul for coming on the podcast and my first ever live podcast episode so um for those of you listening i'll leave this little bit in so that you know this was a video on facebook out there (laughs) to the world (laughs) no editing but um yeah the podcast will have some editing in there so my shit bits will be taken out. (laughs) Thank you. And I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing everything that we do. My my sister and I, Hard Hat Mentor, Steel Cat Sisters, you've been one of our champions for a long time and we really appreciate that. So hopefully this helps to share all of the good things that you're doing as well. And thank you to the people that have um, been commenting and, and, uh, saying how great job we've done Paul so that's good that's good thank you (laughs) cheers bye thank you so much for still being here at the end of this epic episode I know there are a few audio glitches there which came about because it was a Facebook live and it's a long story but there was an echo but hopefully my decision to put it out there anyway the best that I could was worth it for you. 
Remember, you can head to the Mad Mumsy Facebook page, look for videos, and you can watch us actually record that episode live. And we would love to see your comments in there as well. Join the conversation. Thank you so much. And until next time, stay safe, be real, be special, and have fun for we only live once. Cheers. And please share with your mates. <laughs>